We're now joined by Amin Gunsur of Ava Labs. So let's see what we're missing in order to change finance. All right, so let me uh, share my presentation here. And I want to talk to you today about DeFi, the big talk of the town these days. And uh, let's see if I can, why did I lose my, uh, my sharing screen? Well, let's just go with this. So today I want to talk to you about DeFi and uh, give you a story of trapped exotic instruments. They're trapped on blockchains and they are nowhere near what uh, they have the potential to achieve. So um, now what, first of all, is DeFi? Well, DeFi is building a new ecosystem of trustless financial building blocks. This is revolutionary. It's a threat to the existing financial world. It's also a huge opportunity for many startups to come. So while there is a huge, big movement ahead to reimagine finance in a much more open fashion, we are currently faced with a lot of obstacles uh, that keep DeFi from, from doing everything that it can do. What are these problems? Problem number one is that the infrastructure for DeFi is absolutely abysmal. The big problem, the main problem, is that the infrastructure on which this stuff is based is absolutely abysmal. It's nowhere near what, where it needs to be to meet the demand that these uh, new instruments put on the system. The power of decentralized, unstoppable, on-chain trading can only shine when we can actually automate these systems and when we can actually uh, start supporting trades at uh, thousands of transactions per second. And today we're only able to do in a decentralized fashion, only able to do uh, transaction processing at, at most a few dozen TPS. And that's nowhere near where we need to be. The second big problem is that the DeFi world has turned inwards. It's opening us, it's giving us exposure to cash flows and pools of other DeFi products, and it's layers upon layers of inward-facing products. That's okay. These inward-facing products are revolutionary and new in their own way, but they can only grow so big by facing inwards. What we need to do, this is part of the, the, uh, the case I will try to make today, uh, what we need to do is allow these systems to capture the great amount of value in the outside world that is outside of blockchains. This is something that Chainlink is trying to bring in with its own uh, Oracle infrastructure. But deep down, why should that value come into any, ch any chain when that chain cannot handle the demands of a new domain? How could that value enter blockchains when these domains require thousands of transactions per second and the blockchains we have today can only handle dozens? And so that gives rise to problem number three. Many DeFi products are what I would call bad DeFi products. They're, they have a Ponzi-like element or a pyramid-like element. They're not really creating value for the participants, at least the late participants. And, uh, and so they, we, we leave the, the, the sort of the territory of the good, actually, uh, actually population serving uh, uh, desirable products. And we go into inward facing get rich quick schemes that nobody really wants to see that are not, that cannot be with us in the long term. So how do we fix this? Well, let's talk a little bit about this, this very first problem, which is performance and scale. And let me very quickly talk a little bit about something that I see that a lot of people are mistaking. And I do this often. I try to correct uh, when, uh, when I see that the crypto Twitter world is going in a, in a bad direction. Here is one where I see people going in a terrible direction. A lot of people are trying to measure scale by a single metric. They're trying to use throughput and they're trying to use transactions per second. Transactions per second is a very important metric, but it's by no means the only metric. There are many others out there. Another one that's just as important is latency. And latency is crucial. Latency is the time from the time when you submit your transaction and the time when it ends. And throughput is the number of transactions that a system could process per second. Imagine a system that makes you wait 24 hours, batches everything that's happened that day, and then suddenly approves everything that's happened in that day. That system could have very high throughput, but the latency would be a day. So you don't want systems like that. You want to be able to interact with financial systems on the fly because life happens and you need to catch up to it. Latency and low latency systems are amazing. Once you use one, you'll never be able to go back. And I bet you, you've never used one. There have been very, very few of these around. So if you look at Bitcoin, for example, the latency to finality is one hour. If you look at Ethereum, the latency to finality uh, is about half an hour for equivalent security. 
And, uh, and you know, if you want to just go with something that's not final and you want to kind of YOLO your transactions, then uh, latency is, is 14 seconds. All of those are incredibly high latencies. To be able to have an interactive system, you need to go to a second or below. So how is scalability measured then? Scalability isn't a single thing. So it's a function of how one thing changes, one performance metric changes as you increase something else. So as I increase the number of network participants, as, as Zuckerberg gets more people in to, uh, to his system, uh, how will the throughput of his system behave? Well, I can tell you, he is using a classical system, a classical consensus protocol. He can't add more than 100 people to his system. His system will always be a closed, tiny network. And so that system is a dead end technologically. And it is by far, by far the best protocol in the classical domain. It's designed by uh, my former student, or by my current student who formerly worked on it, who is now currently working on Avalanche. So, or you can look at latency. If I have more and more people using my system, how long does it take for their transactions to get approved? So those, that's what actually matters for latency. So when, what happens then when we try to build innovative financial products that don't currently exist in mainstream finance? There is, of course, the problem of performance and scale. But there are a bunch of other problems as well. I'm not going to, a lot of people have heard me talk about Avalanche and how it has a revolutionary uh, approach to the consensus problem. It's the third big improvement in that space that's been around for only half a century, for about 45 years. The last big improvement was by Satoshi Nakamoto and the Avalanche consensus protocol is just as big a step forward. But I want to talk to you um, uh, from a different perspective today. I want to talk to you from applications on down. What happens when you try to build three exemplar applications? And in this case, I want to start by looking at DEXs. DEXs are amazing. Everybody who's used a decentralized exchange knows that they provide a value proposition that's, uh, com that's much better compared to centralized exchanges. Why? Well, first of all, nobody can exit scam. They're non-custodial. Nobody can front run you. This minor extractable value, the work that uh, Phil Dion and colleagues did, uh, that showed that you could front run exchanges and make about $3,000 uh, a day uh, is amazing. And people do this on current centralized exchanges. Now, it also turns out that Wall Street thrives on front running. They sell the mainstream order flow to a whole slew of companies. And that keeps normal people like you and me from having equally fair access to markets. And that's a terrible, terrible thing. Third big pro property of DEXs can be the fact that they can offer fair or best execution with limited slippage and without preferential treatment for anyone. When I submit an order, I want to match against the best opposing order for me. I don't want anybody coming in between me and the market. And I would like to be able to achieve this algorithmically. And finally, and this is most importantly, confidentiality is critical. If the exchange operator knows my positions, he can do what's known as stop loss hunting. If he knows that I've used leverage and if the price dips by 5%, I'll get wrecked. Then he can dip the price by 5% by wreck me, let the price float up, and in the process collect my, my, uh, my funds. So these are targeted shakeouts. These are absolutely horrible. Wall Street only stems these by layers upon layers of auditing. And despite that, every decade or so, there's a giant, uh, giant scandal there as well. Existing DEXs are not very good at achieving these four properties that are crucial. They are venues of last resort. And one of the main reasons is because of latency. They lag behind the market. A secure DEX will take about 30 minutes to finalize a transaction. Even 14 seconds is an eternity. Ask anybody if they would like to, any professional trader, if they would like to use a system to trade on Wall Street, with Wall Street assets that's lagging by 14 seconds, and they will just laugh at you. Um, data feeds that are 14 seconds out of date from Wall Street are free because they're worthless. Like, people often give that up. You want to be real time. An exchange is either real time or else it's an irrelevant, gameable trailer and suited only for those instruments that have no other home. So how do we fix this? Well, first of all, we need a better consensus mechanism. So you know that Ethereum 1.0 is far too slow. You know that uh, the other opposing chains, that other competing chains are coming up with other protocols, all of them in the same fold as classical protocols. Those protocols existed for about 45 years. They, they were known when Satoshi came along. 
Um, and we know that they are, they're fragile, and we know that they're not going to achieve the kinds of, uh, kinds of uh, scale and throughput that these applications demand. Ethereum 2.0, for example, is designed for sharding. It targets throughput. It does not target latency. Avalanche is special. It achieves very, very low latencies. And it can take the finalization latency, that is one hour for Bitcoin, down to one second or below. So it's finally possible to have a web service whose backend is based on a blockchain. And, uh, and one second, of course, is great. It's an absolute huge improvement, but it also can be improved upon even further. And at Ava Labs, we're working on technologies to build DEXs that can go from, that can take that transaction finality down from one second to less than a millisecond. When you change the performance of a system by more than five orders of magnitude, it's a game changer. And this game, the new game, is not only new for crypto, where it's badly needed because we know the crypto exchanges are gamed all the time, but it's new for Wall Street as well. The Wall Street folks have nothing on us. They, every time you go to them, they look down on you and they say, well, you haven't met this standard or that standard. This is a standard they do not meet. Their systems are inferior compared to what is about to come. Okay, so let me very quickly talk about prediction markets. Prediction markets are another interesting example uh, use of uh, DeFi technologies, but today they're hampered by latencies and, latencies and fees. Trading on prediction markets often happens uh, in, in reaction to new information flow. When the oracles uh, bring in new information or when something happens in the external world, there's a race. There's a race to the blockchain. And it's absolutely essential to have the right kind of infrastructure for being able to, to operate on that new information. High latencies pose difficulty, and high fees keep markets from equalizing to natural equilibria. Here's a simple thought experiment. If, suppose we all had a bet on uh, that, uh, that, that person X would win the, um, the, the, the primary, for example, would win, let's say, the presidential uh, uh, election. But the, the size of the bet was less than the size of the, than the amount of the, the transaction required to, um, uh, to, to affect a change on the Ethereum blockchain. That is the size of my bet and everyone's bet is less than a transaction fee. Well, then we would not be able to, to normalize. That market would forever be skewed because people are unwilling to pay uh, to, to convert and uh, have the prediction market reflect reality. And now why are fees high? Because the fee mechanism used by every single chain in existence is broken. There's been great work in this space by Aviv Zohar and his group, by Vitalik Buterin and his group, and, uh, and by my group. There have been three proposals here. And uh, these proposals are, are, are hoping to change the fee mechanism to try to lower the fees. But the real reason, the, the fundamental reason why the, the bad fee mechanism is so in our faces these days is because the capacity of the network underneath is so low. So it's much easier and better to change the capacity of the network than to actually try to change these fee mechanisms. And I say this as one of the three people who worked on that, that, that very mechanism. So we need chains that can provide much faster latencies, they can, chains that can provide much higher throughput, and chains that can lower fees. Finally, I want to talk to you very quickly about corporate debt. Corporate debt instruments are huge. Now, you and I typically don't see them. That, that world is opaque to us. And I have a very long and funny story about how I tried to buy some, some, uh, uh, some sovereign debt, actually, in upstate New York. I tried to buy Russian uh, bonds, and, and essentially I got laughed out of a, of a bank. Um, so, uh, but the bottom line is there is trillions and trillions changing hands out there somewhere. And we are forever locked out of that world. We don't have access. Um, now, why are, why are those instruments not represented in any of our current blockchains today? Well, let me very quickly outline at least one big reason that I see that I haven't seen anybody else mention. And it's very simple, and once you hear it, I think you will hopefully understand that there is something fundamental here. And that is this. ERC-20s and other programmatic methods of building new assets are inadequate for representing these kinds of assets. ERC-20s appear to the system as just code. The miners cannot partake in the value created. The DEXs cannot understand what they're trading. These are complex instruments. They have whole sets of complicated rules that are bespoke for each and every single bond or uh, debt instrument. And to validate a transaction, you need to understand exactly what it is that you're handling 
and apply rules specific to that. So Avalanche supports this by making these assets first-class abstractions. It gives the, uh, the stakers the ability to partake in that value that's being created through abstractions that they understand. And most importantly, Avalanche supports sub-networks. It is not a single network that, uh, that is meant to be everything to everyone, but is instead some extra legal entity that, doesn't, that isn't good for anybody at all. To the contrary, it allows, it gives you a unified system in which you can create sub-networks with their own rules that govern the participation in those networks, in those sub-networks. So, um, so that allows the underlying system to know what it's dealing with and the underlying system to react to things that happen that are unforeseeable. When rules change, when new legislation comes in, when the handling of an asset must change, then the sub-network can take action. Today's blockchains are extra legal. They only enforce their own nodes, their own uh, rules. They cannot, uh, they cannot react to any changes in the outside world. They have no, no home jurisdiction. But you can, under Avalanche, have a sub-network wherein all of the nodes have, uh, for example, voluntarily opted into an agreement that you want them to opt into. Or wherein all nodes are U.S. nodes, and therefore they're bound by U.S. law or wherein all nodes are upholding the GDPR confidentiality requirements, and so on. We believe that this is a crucial enabler. And if you ever talk to the legal department of an enterprise, everybody will say this, that yes, we know how to digitize assets, but no, we can't, because the existing chains do not allow us to actually understand the legal foundation. Avalanche gives us a proper legal foundation for assets created on top. So, in summary, um, what happened? Well, Carol Baskin killed her husband, fed him to tigers. I think that much we learned from Tiger King. Uh, the DeFi kings are, go are going to show us that Wall Street feeds its users to a bunch of sharks. All of our order flows are subject uh, to a bunch of people who've, who've essentially mastered how to uh, extract value out of that, that world, and regulation keeps everybody else out. Further, there is a, a universe of assets that are not in blockchain form that are completely uh, inaccessible to us. DeFi could fix this, but only if its infrastructure problems are addressed. These infrastructure problems relate to performance, they relate to scale, they relate to control. And addressing these problems will open up the stage for fast, competitive, and most importantly, externally facing instruments that capture the value out in the real world, as opposed to turning inwards and trying to extract value from the closed universe of crypto assets. That's what we're working on Avalanche. Um, we, have, uh, we recently had our Everest testnet out. Uh, we have our mainnet coming up very soon, and uh, we invite everybody who's excited to come and play with the system. It provides a, a set of features that are really interesting. Thank you. That was great. Thank you, Dr. Sir.